In this presentation, I'll be talking to you about my use of concrete poetry in my art practice. Despite the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, I sometimes find that a picture needs some words to hit home. Poetry is one creative way to add those words. I will be the first to admit that I'm not a poet. I am a visual artist, environmentalist, and animal advocate. I work in a number of media on a variety of interrelated subjects. The problematized landscape, consumption and waste, industrialized animal agriculture, diversity loss, and climate change. I often feature animals or things that don't otherwise get noticed in order to move them up on the mattering scale. Many of the subjects I pursue are difficult and highly politicized. In his book, Hyper Objects, literary theorist and philosopher Timothy Morton defines hyper objects as things that are massively distributed in time and space relative to humans, which by their immense scope, scale, and immersive properties cannot be observed or fully comprehended by humans. Morton thinks climate change, industrialized agriculture, the petrochemical economy, and masses of plastic on earth are and even nature are hyper objects. He suggests that although we can detect local manifestations of these entities, we are not able to fully comprehend the hyper objects themselves. This means we often take a narrow, self centered view of a situation. Morton believes that art can help us comprehend hyper objects in ways that transcend self interest. In his book, he refers to Marina Zirko's Mesocosm, Winks, Texas, as an example of art that can alter our perception of nature. I aspire to the same outcome. Concrete is also a hyper object. According to BBC Future, concrete accounts for around half of all human made things. It is the single biggest category of anthropogenic material, but less than a century ago, it was not the ubiquitous construction material we take for granted. Concrete carried within it the potential for new forms and possibilities, especially in the discourse surrounding modern architecture. Early in the 20th century, it was used to construct new skyscrapers, dams, highways, and other curved structures. By mid-century, it was being used to shape exotic and audacious structures such as the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York City. So mid-century, the word concrete would have had a positive fluid connotation, something with which to realize new and innovative ideas. The international concrete poetry movement was active in many countries in the 1950s and 1960s. These poets wanted to add a visual aspect to their poetry to unify, unify form and meaning. They used words as construction materials, both visually and orally. One of the founding members of the concrete poetry movement was German-Swiss-Bolivian poet Eugène Gomringer. In his poem, Silencio, the word silencio is repeated 14 times to frame an empty or quiet space. In essence, silence is enacted by the gap at the center of the text. According to Jamie Hilder in his book, Designed Words for a Designed World, concrete poetry gained considerable popularity in a time of rapid socioeconomic change brought about by post-war growth, technological advancement, and globalization. Unfortunately, it was never critically appreciated because of its broad international reach and the challenge of situating it within any critical framework. Nevertheless, it has persisted. Hilder suggests that given recent cultural and technological transformations on a global scale, concrete poetry seems more relevant than ever. I first became aware of concrete poetry and prose in 2021 when I participated in a virtual conference on the climate emergency held by ASLI, the Association for the Study of Literature and the Environment. 
fellow panelist, Dr. Michael Hewson, a geography professor at CQ University, Australia, gave a presentation called A Picture Paints a Policy Change, in which he used concrete prose to tell a story of environmental protection brought about by the photograph on the right. Hewson presented his rather lengthy, complex text in a form that visually swirled like a flowing river. I had an idea. Horizon Lost and Found is a time-lapse video made with 15 months of daily photographs of the Ottawa River shoreline across Britannia Bay, where I live. I started taking these photographs as part of my daily pandemic red, uh, ritual. By the summer of 2021, forest fires were ra raging in Ontario and elsewhere. It was time to move on. I had been trying to come up with a soundtrack for the video that could link the flow of days, months, and seasons to the climate emergency. After seeing Michael's presentation, I decided to use concrete prose. Not only would the spoken text add meaning and urgency to the otherwise placid and soundless video, but I would have a visual representation of it. To construct Horizon Is, I generated over 150 short sentences of varying lengths, each starting with Horizon Is. I put them in an Excel spreadsheet and classified each as either A, positive, or B, negative in tone. To create the shape you see, I sorted the rows on tone and then by the number of characters in each sentence. I will read excerpts from the beginning and the end so you can hear the change in tone. Horizon is a line. Horizon is any boundary. Horizon is my through line. Horizon is what the eye seeks. Horizon is self-actualization. Horizon is a symbol of freedom. Horizon is where miracles happen. These lines are at the opposite end. Horizon is rising as sea level rises. Horizon is an illusion of progress. Horizon is the point of no return. Horizon is a place of farewells. Horizon is the next pandemic. Horizon is climate change. Horizon is upon us. Horizon is here. Horizon is now. Horizon is. When the text is turned on its side, it mimics, it mimics the cross-section of a river. So in the end, I had a lovely film still to represent my video. Next, I'll talk to you about my poem, Elegy for the Silver Eel. My interest in eels was first piqued when I responded to an Ottawa Riverkeeper appeal to save the American eel. In 2017, this once abundant snake-like fish was declared an endangered species. It is now almost extirpated from the Ottawa River watershed because of the poorly designed hydroelectric dams and generating stations that block eel migration to and from their breeding grounds in the Sargasso Sea. How could I express my anguish I felt for the loss of this species in my own backyard? I turned to poetry. I used the haiku format for my stance as short and crisp. Afterwards, I simply manipulated the text into a shape, so it too became a form of concrete poetry. I first presented this poem last October in Cornwall at the River Institute Ways of Knowing Symposium. There I met Stephanie Hildebrand. She had taken this picture of a dying silver eel before it was euthanized. The eel was likely injured trying to escape the Carillon generating station where the Ottawa River meets the St. Lawrence. It was as if I had written my poem for this eel. By the way, a silver eel is a sexually mature female American eel that is 10 or more years old, ready to head back to the Sargasso to breed and die. Young adult eels are much smaller and yellowish. I'll read it. Elegy for the Silver Eel. Swirling silently, the autumn moon signaling the Sargasso calls. Lithe yellow bodies fighting flow from dam to here, a lifetime ago. Hunt, eat, sleep, watch, wait. Grow, crawl, escape, hibernate. Survive decades more. The breeding clock sounds. Journey from river to sea. Cut short. Turbine blades. No deeper meeting. No larvae. Elvers, glass eels. Coitus interruptus. Human predation. 
ecospheric disruption. What's next? Extinction? O2 Ordovician limestone is written about the Deschenes Rapids and the surrounding shoreline near where I live. I know this place, this piece is quite technical, but I wanted to capture the time scale of Earth's geological history and at the same time express my personal feelings about place. In the end, I think it is the poem I wanted to write for a long time. O2 Ordovician limestone. Smooth water twitches, writhes, and roils, a rushing roar cancelling all other sounds. Gulls hover silently as the river rushes down the limestone stairs stretching shore to shore. Clear waters gathering from places far away and as big as England flow down these rapids. On the time scale marking the age of rivers, the Ottawa is still quite young, but the landscape she traverses is primordial a reliquary of deep time. This limestone was laid down in the Ordovician period nearly half a billion years ago, when warm calcite seas entombed countless creatures in their eternal graves, exhumed at last as the fresh cool river courses its way to the ocean. A weathered outcrop seeping black groundwater through faults and fissures, cracks, fragments, flakes, and falls free on the shoreline underfoot. In the Ordovician, the place where I now stand was on the equator. There, the calm, shallow, tropical seas spawned an explosion of life. Echinoderms, bryozoans, brachiopods, and trilobites, this amateur paleontologist's dream. Eat and be eaten, secretions and body parts raining down, rippled by gentle waves above, mementos encased in shades of grey, layer upon layer, marking the passage of time. A cool earth triggered by wandering continents ended the Ordovician with Earth's first mass extinction. 85% of life gone, secrets and possibilities lost forever. Then this place came silent too, a geological unconformity. But we get the picture, more mass extinctions with the jury still out on the sixth. Climate change has always been a planetary game changer, and here we are again, rising CO2, rising temperatures, rising water levels, rising fears. How imminent is extinction? How resilient is life on Earth? How long do we really have? The future, like the Ordovician limestone underfoot, looms silently and promises nothing.